Hey guys, this is the message I was going to do this morning, but I had to catch up because I couldn't do March 7th because my phone died yesterday. But anyways, uh, this is the message for March 8th. It's going to be titled The, Relin the Relinquished Life. Oh man, my throat's just killing me. I don't know why. Or it doesn't kill me, it's just it's really hard to talk because... I think I'm still recovering from being kind of sick, but the relinquished life, you know, relinquished is just like, you know, I guess it's a, like new, you know, like a re brought back, you know, refilled, you know, kind of, I don't know the real true meaning of relinquish, but that's what I get out of that. We're going to be in uh, Galatians chapter 2, and the verse of the day is 20. But before I start reading chapter 2, I'm going to read what the book of Galatians is about. And I think that's really important for us to know as Christians what each book's about. So Galatians has certain a certain thing to it, you know. It's got a certain meaning and a subject to the book and why this book was written. So we need to know why... And how and what this book's about. Like why why was this done? So let's read about it and see what's going on. A family executing their carefully planned escape at midnight, dashing for the border. A man standing outside prison walls, gulping fresh air, awash in the new sun. A young woman with every trace of ravaging drug gone from her system. They were free. With fresh anticipation, they can begin life anew. Whether fleeing oppression, stepping out of prison, or breaking a strangling habit, freedom means life. There's nothing so exhilarating as knowing that the past is forgotten and that new options await. People yearn to be free. The book of Galatians is the charter of Christian freedom. In this profound letter, Paul proclaims the reality of our liberty in Christ, freedom from the law and the power of sin, and freedom to serve our living Lord. Most of the first converts and early leaders in the church were Jewish Christians who proclaimed Jesus as their Messiah. As Jewish Christians, they struggle with a dual identity. Their Jewishness constrained them to be strict followers of the law. Their newfound faith in Christ invited them to celebrate a holy liberty. They wondered how Gentiles, Gentile means non-Jew, could be part of the kingdom of heaven. This controversy tore the early church, the Judaizers, Judeiz I can't say that, Judaizers, or Juda Judaizers, I don't know. It means a, an extremist Jewish faction within the church. So that's what that means, the Judaizers, an extreme Jewish faction within the church, taught the Gentile Christians had to submit to Jewish laws and traditions in addition to believing in Christ. As a missionary to the Gentiles, Paul had to confront this issue many times. Galatians was written, therefore, to refute the Judaizers the Judaizers, or whatever that word is, and to call believers back to the pure gospel. The good news is for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. Salvation is by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus and nothing else. Faith in Christ means true freedom. After a brief introduction, Paul addresses those who are accepting the Judaizers' perverted gospel. He summarizes the controversy including his personal confrontation with Peter and other church leaders. He then demonstrates that salvation is by faith alone by alluding to his convert or conversion. So, appealing to his readers' own experience of the gospel and showing how the Old Testament teaches about grace. Next, he explains the purpose of God's laws and the relationship between law, God's promises, and Christ. Having laid the foundation, Paul builds his case for Christian liberty. We are saved by faith, not by keeping the law. Our freedom means 
that we are free to love and serve one another, not to do wrong. And Christians should carry each other's burdens and be kind to each other. Paul takes the pen into his own hand and shares his final thoughts. As you read Galatians, try to understand this first century conflict between grace and law, or faith and deeds, but also be aware of modern parallels. Like Paul, defend the truth of the gospel and reject all those who would add or twist this truth. You are free in Christ. Step into the light and celebrate. So this is going to be a really powerful book if you want to start reading it. Uh, that P, uh, Paul wrote, and he, he he's laying the foundation down and just showing the freedoms of being a Christian and starting to do the right thing for one another. So I'm going to read all of chapter 2 here. The Apostles Accept Paul. And then 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again. This time was with Barnabas. And Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Even that question came up only because of someone or some so-called Christians there. False ones. Really? Who were secretly brought in? They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations, but we refused to give in to them for a single moment. We wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. By the way, their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep practice, or keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. Paul confronts Peter. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. For what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile Christians who were not circumcised, but afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish Christians followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by, his, by their hypo hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, Since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile. Why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right by God, or God, with God, by faith in Jesus Christ, not obeying the law. And we have believed in Jesus Christ, so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me, so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for God. Now this is the verse of the day. My old self has been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer who I live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for it, keeping the law could make us right with God. Then there was no need for Christ to die. It's powerful. So, when we accepted Christ in our lives, we gave our, our body died by us giving our lives to Christ. So we got to live for God in everything we do. And we're not perfect, but if you start taking into effect in the count everything doing right through God, then it will just, you, you'll be able to obey the law because His laws and His ways are stronger than the law. And... You know, it's all in goodness and all in truth. So if the laws are bad, you know, and it's a bad law and, you know, that's not right, that doesn't mean you you don't have to do that. You know what I mean? You're just taking that next step to, you know, taking the higher road. So I'm going to read uh, more about in depth what, what my study Bible talks about, chapter 2. Paul was converted around A.D. 35. The 14 years he mentions are probably calculated from the time of his conversion. Therefore, this trip to Jerusalem was not his first. Most likely, he made his first trip to Jerusalem around A.D. 38. And other trips to Jerusalem in approximately A.D. 44, A.D. 49 and 50, and A.D. 52, and A.D. 57. Paul probably visited Jerusalem on several other occasions as well. Barnabas and Titus were two of Paul's close friends. Barnabas and Paul visited Galatia together on their first missionary journey. Paul wrote a personal letter to Titus, a faithful believer and church leader serving on the island of Crete. For more information on Barnabas, see his profile in Acts 13. For more information on Titus, see the letter Paul wrote to him in the New Testament. After his conversion, Paul spent many years preparing for the ministry to which God had called him. This preparation period included time alone with God, as well as time conferring with other Christians. Often new Christians, in their zeal, want to begin a full-time ministry without investing the necessary time studying the Bible and learning from qualified teachers. We need to not wait to share Christ with our friends, but we may need more preparation before embarking on a special ministry. Whether volunteer or paid, while we wait for God's timing, we should continue to study, learn, and grow. God told Paul through a revelation to confer with the church leaders in Jerusalem about the message he was preaching to the Gentiles so they would understand and approve of what he was doing. The essence of Paul's message to both Jews and Gentiles was that God's salvation is offered to all people regardless of race, sex, nationality, wealth, social standing, and education level, or anything else. Anyone can be forgiven by trusting in Christ. It also talks about this in Romans chapter 10, verses 8-13. through 13. Even though God had specifically sent him to the Gentiles, Paul needed to discuss his message with the leaders of Jerusalem church. This meeting prevented a major split in the church, and it formally acknowledged the apostles' approval of Paul's preaching. Sometimes we avoid conferring with others because we fear the problems or arguments may develop. Instead, we should openly discuss our plans and actions with friends, counselors, and advisors. Good communication helps everyone understand the situation better. It reduces gossip, and it builds unity in the church. When Paul took Titus, a Greek Christian, to Jerusalem, the Ju Judaizers, the false Christians, said that Titus would be circumcised. Paul adamantly refused to give in to their deeds. The apostles agreed that circumcision was an unnecessary right for Gentile converts. Several years later, Paul circumcised Timothy, another Greek Christian. Unlike Titus, however, Timothy was half Jewish. Paul did not deny Jews the right to be circumcised. He was simply saying that Gentiles should not be 
asked to become Jews before becoming Christians. These false Christians were most likely from the party of their Pharisees. These were the strictest religious leaders of Judaism, some of whom had been converted. We don't know if these were representatives of well-meaning converts or of those trying to pervert Christianity. Most commentators agree that neither Peter nor James had any part in this conspiracy. We normally think of taking a stand against those who might lead us into immoral behavior, but Paul had to take a hard line against the most moral of people. We must not give in to those who make the keeping of man-made standards a condition for salvation, even when p such people are morally upright or in respected positions. <coughs> you hear that? He was standing up against things that weren't right. No matter what their position is, you tell them that it's right, not right. You tell them that they're, what they're doing is wrong. You need to, we need to do that in some things in our lives. Have courage and stand firmly on the foundation. You know what's right and wrong. Stand on it. Stand on what's right. The truth. It's easy to rape people on the basis of their official status and to be imitated by powerful people, but Paul was not imitated by these great leaders because all believers are equal in Christ. We should show respect for our spiritual leaders, but our ultimate allegiance must be to Christ. We are to serve Him with our whole being. God doesn't rate us according to our status. He looks at the attitude of our hearts. He talks about that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. We should encourage leaders to show humility and a heartfelt desire to please God. The church leaders are pillars, James, the half-brother of Jesus, not the apostle. Peter and John realized that God was using Paul to reach the Gentiles. Just as Peter was being used to greatly reach the Jews. After hearing Paul's message, they gave Paul and Barnabas their approval to continue working among the Gentiles. <coughs> Sorry, guys. My throat's just killing me. The apostles were referring to the poor of Jer Jerusalem. While many Gentile converts were financially comfortable, the Jerusalem church had suffered from the effects of severe famine in Palestine and was struggling. So on this journey, or on his journeys, Paul had gathered funds for the Jewish Christians. For believers to care for the poor is a constant theme in Scripture, but often we do nothing, caught up in meeting our own needs and desires. Perhaps we don't see enough poverty to remember the needs of the poor. The world is filled with poor people, here and in the other countries. We can, or what can you do to help? This was Antioch of Syria. Distinguished from Antioch in Pisidia, a major trade center in the ancient world, heavenly populated by Dr Greeks, it eventually became a strong Christian center. In Antioch, the believers were first called Christians. Antioch of Syria became the headquarters for the Gentile church and was Paul's base of operations. The Judaizers accused Paul of watering down the good news to make it easier for Gentiles to accept. While Paul accused the Judaizers of nullifying the truth of the good news by adding conditions to it, the basis of salvation was the issue. Is salvation through Christ alone or does it come through Christ and adherence to the law? The argument came to a climax when Peter, Paul, the Judaizers, and some Gentile Christians all gathered together in Antioch to share a meal. Peter probably thought that by staying away from the Gentiles, he was promoting harmony. He did not want to offend James and the Jewish Christians. James had very prominently, a very prominent position and presided over Jerusalem Council. But Paul charged that Peter's actions violated the good news. By joining the Judaizers, Judaizers Peter implicitly, implicitly was supporting their claim that Christ was not sufficient for salvation. Compromise is an important element in getting along with others, but we should never compromise the truth of God's Word. If we feel we have to change our Christian beliefs to match those of our companions, we are on the dangerous ground.
<laughs> Although Peter was a leader of the church, he was acting like a hypocrite. He knew better. Yet he was driven by fear of what James and others would think. Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap. Paul knew that he had to confront Peter before his actions damaged the church. So, Paul confront Peter before his actions damaged the church. Now, I, I repeated that. So, Paul publicly opposed Peter. Note, however, that Paul did not go to the other leaders, nor did he write letters to the churches telling them not to follow Peter's example. Instead, he opposed Peter face to face, which is... When you got a problem, you got to go face to face with people sometimes. So we got to handle them, not let it go. Sometimes sincere Christians, even Christian leaders, make mistakes. And it may take other sincere Christians to get them back on track. If you are convinced that someone is doing harm to himself or herself or the church, try the direct approach. There is no place for backstabbing in the body of Christ. We don't like them backstabbers, neither does Christ. We gotta be honest with each other. We gotta not be afraid of each other. We gotta stand to each other face to face with our heart and tell them that we care about them and everybody else and let them know what's going on. If observing the Jewish laws cannot justify us, why should we still obey the Ten Commandments and other Old Testament laws? We know that Paul was not saying the law is bad because in another letter he wrote, the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. Instead, he is saying that the law can never make us acceptable to God. The law still has an important role in play in life of a Christian. The law, one, guards us from sin by giving us standards for behavior. Two, convicts us of sin, leaving us the opportunity to ask for God's forgiveness. And three, it drives us to trust in the sufficiency of Christ because we can never keep the Ten Commandments perfect. The law cannot possibly save us, but after we become Christians, it can guide us to live as God requires. It's very true there. No one's perfect, but it does help to give us a good standard of living. Through studying the Old Testament scriptures, Paul realized that he could not be saved by obeying God's laws. The prophets knew that God's plan of salvation did not rest on keeping the law. Because we have all been affected by sin, we can not keep God's laws perfectly. Fortunately, God has provided a way of salvation that depends on Jesus Christ, not on our own efforts. Even though we know this truth, we must guard against the temptation of using service, good deeds, charitable giving, or any other effort as a substitute for faith. So don't let, don't let what you do guard what what how you really feel and how you how, how your faith is in the Lord because you got to you got to you got to worship God in your, in yourself and give him every day you know or them good good faith doing them good deeds and everything ain't going to amount to much cuz you're not giving giving it to God but it's good to do good deeds don't get me wrong but if you're not doing it for God and you're not you know honoring him for them then then, then what's the point but uh but it's always good to do good things. I'm not saying it's not. How have your old selves been crucified with Christ? Legally, God looks at us as if we had died with Christ. Because our sins die with Him, we are no longer condemned. Relationally, we have become one with Christ, and His experiences are ours. Our Christian life began when, in unity with Him, we died to our old life. In our daily life, we must regularly crucify sinful desires that keep us from following Christ. This, too, is a kind of dying with Him. And yet, the focus of Christianity is not dying, but on living. Because we have been crucified with Christ, we have also been raised with Him. Legally, we have been reconciled with God and are free to grow into Christ's likeness. And in our daily life, we have Christ's resurrection power as we continue to fight sin. We are no longer alone, for Christ lives in us. He is our power for living and our hope for the future. 
Believers today may be in danger of acting as if there was no need for Christ to die. How? By replacing Jewish legalism with their own brand of Christian legalism? They are not giving people extra laws to obey. By believing they earn God's favor by what they do, they are not trusting completely in Christ's work on the cross. So I'm going to read that one more time. By believing they can earn God's favor by what they do, they are not trusting completely in Christ's work on the cross. So don't don't think you're going to do good in that and it, it's not about that. And he's saying that right now. By struggling to appropriate God's powers to change them, sanctification, they are not resting in God's power to save them. Justification. If we could be saved by being good, then Christ would not have to die. But the cross is the only way to salvation. So, just because you do good things doesn't mean that this is what this what, what we're going to be talking about. Just because you do good things doesn't mean that you're saved. That's great you do good things. But let's take it to the next note. Let's give them to God. Honor God for those good things and see how much more good things you can do. You know, uh, it's like what the, Paul talks about this a lot, actually, with throughout his walk and all of his books. Is this like if you're gonna if you're gonna do something without love uh, for God, then then what are you? You know, and uh, like if you don't have that love, and it, it's like it's like you're doing it with nothing. It's heartless. There's no meaning to it. You're just empty. And, you know, with God, you're not empty. You're full. You're an overflowing cup. And it's so important that we got to we gotta honor God for what He de- gives us every day. And, you know, if you don't think it's much, it's actually probably a lot more than just what you think. You got to humble yourself and be happy with what you got. Because you might have a lot more than other people's have. And, uh, you know, you got to be thankful. But if you can be thankful if, if you don't have nothing, then if you have anything from having nothing, then you'd be way happier. You know? And you can't go to God expecting to do good and get things in return. That's not that's not how this works. But if you give God everything you can every day, He's gonna form you in the way He needs you to be. And and that's and that's what you, you should want is to grow in Him. And it's so, that's, that's what this is about. It's not, it's not about what you have materially here on earth. It's not all about that. It's more than that. You'll just be as a wholer person. You'll be revived. You'll be, a, you'll be like living, living life, living word. You'll just have this light about you. And, you know, we can be this light for anybody. There's a lot more to it than than what we have. Never was about that. Never was about that. If it was about that, then Jesus would have never talked about, or he, he was talking to the Pharisees, he's saying, uh, whose money is this? They're like, Caesar's. Well, give to Caesar what is his, Caesar's, you know? You know, it, it's not about that. It's about honoring God. He's the one who created us in the beginning. Or He's our Father. You know. Jesus came to tell us that. Jesus died for our sins. To start, you know, for what, what, what we did. He suffered as, a, as, a, as the Son of God on the cross. He got to experience all of the human feelings and everything. He never sinned. You know. He understands all them hungers and everything. But he was powerful. You know, he, he never sinned. He, you know, he was over all that. And he knows how we are. And if you give him, he'll, he'll work through you to overcome these things that you never thought you could overcome. Like for me, you know, I'm overcoming uh, drinking. Never uh, plan on drinking a, a, another day in my life. I, I'm finding out more about it. And that was one of my biggest problems in my life. It took me a long time, but it, I'm finally there. 
Now I can give my life more to God than ever before. And I've followed God since I was 18. Or actually since I was five years old. You know, my, or lower than that. My grandparents were always taking me to church. You know, I could talk about God till I'm blue in the face. I really love Him and He's a great God. You know, I don't have the most perfect walk. But you know what? I'm still going to stand here and I'm going to preach His name. Or profess His name because that's all I can do. And I hope you, help you give your life to God. Because he's gonna work in you and he's gonna change you into a person you never thought you could be before. This is what that's what this is about. And it's not about you, it's about others, and other people will see that. It's for his plan. It's not for ours. It never was. All we can do is pass this message along and hope that we can save at least one soul. Because one soul is worth more than the whole world. He talks about that as your soul. He asks a question. Somebody asks a question in this word. He says, is your soul worth more than the world? You know, would you give, would you give that up for this world? No. To live forever, you know, you can't live forever. So let it, let it be that way. So I'm going to read today's daily devotion and see what it says. No one is ever united with Jesus Christ until he is willing to relinquish not sin only, but his whole way of looking at things. To be born from above the Spirit of God means that we must let go before we lay hold. And in the first stages, it is the relinquishing of all pretense. So, relinquishing is like letting go of all the old ways, I reckon. I, that's where I'm getting from. It, uh, it's a little different from what I was talking about earlier. What our Lord wants us to present to Him is not goodness, nor honesty, nor endeavor, but real solid sin. That is all He can take from us. And what does He give in exchange for our sin? Real solid righteousness. <laughs> it's powerful. It's give Him our sin. There's a lot of things that we do and we, the only thing we can do is give Him up to change for our betterment for Him. But we must relinquish all pretense of being anything. All claim of being worthy of God's consideration. Yeah, we're definitely not worthy. None of us are worthy. Not even worthy to look at Him. We've got to be fearful of Him. And then the Spirit of God will show us what further there is to relinquish. There will have to be the relinquishing of my claim to my right, to myself, in every phase. Yeah, I mean, that's you gotta, we got to relinquish everything we do. Am I willing to relinquish my hold on all I possess? My hold on my affections and on everything to be identified with the death of Jesus Christ? Are we willing to do that? Give it all for Him. There is always a sharp, painful disillusionment to go through before we do relinquish. When a man really sees himself as the Lord sees him, it is not the abominable sins of the flesh that shock him, but the awful nature of the pride of his own heart against Jesus Christ. When he sees himself in the light of the Lord, the shame and the horror and the desperate conviction come home. If you are up against the question of relinquishing, go through the crisis, relinquish all, and God will make you fit for all that He requires of you. So, relinquish. It's a good, good word. I, I'm going to try to look that up real quick. Relinquish means to give up. So we got to give up these things to get closer to God. He'll give you what you need. He'll protect you. You just got to have that much faith. Can't worry. You got to have your heart that strong in the Lord that He'll just take care of you no matter what. So when you can just give that up, honor our Lord in everything that we do, that is the coming that He needs. And, and He will send you, or He will bring to us what we need. 
And also, he might send this places you never even know, just for a special person. But he knows. God bless you all, and God bless this message tonight. This is just a really powerful message. If you guys listen to this whole 30 minutes, God bless you for doing that. Thank you so much. I, uh, I love talking about God. I really do. And let us grow all together. And if this message helps you guys, please give this a share. And uh, sorry about my voice, but hopefully it'll return where I can talk better. But um, anyways, I'm going to go to prayer. You can pray with me. If not, I'm still going to pray. So, God, thank you for the today. It's just been an amazing day. Couldn't it be any better. Just another day on this earth is just a blessing. And you've already given us this walk of the day to do what we had to do for you. And just want to thank you for that. Lord, I just ask you to be with uh, some people in my heart that you know who they are. Just touch them. You know in my heart who they are. And just please raise them up. And I know you're already with them. But I just want to pray for them because they're so good people. And I love them. And I just got to lift them up in your name, Lord. Lord, I just want to ask you to just no matter what, if we ever get down, just let us raise our heads in your name. When we get down and things and times get hard, just give us that faith just to come to you in, all, in any moment. Give us the strength to change from our ways. No matter in what, what we do, Give us the strength to know when we do something wrong or we do somebody wrong to go face it and change it and do what's right for you. Just give us that strength, Lord. I pray this in your heavenly name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I hope you guys uh, have a great night. And uh, I'm going to be doing a message in the morning, hopefully, for tomorrow. So. Have a great night. I'm out of here.